Our next paper is a contribution to Purdue University. The authors are Wen, Petrov, Brutzner, Ruan, Li, Sam, and uh, Professor Nick Dalgas, who will give the paper. See, we have a small army of people doing this work. Uh, there are three principal investigators involved here. Uh, George Sow uh, in the Laboratory for Renewable Resources in the School of Chemical Engineering at Purdue, John Grissner in Chemistry, and myself. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, the NMR work was done primarily by uh, Dr. Wench, and the kinetic work uh, by Jimmy Lee. Let me just give you a little forecast of where we're going. I'd like to tell you why we're interested in this question of, of the interaction of sugar molecules with zeolites, um, and then talk about two specific issues, whether or not the zeolites can, or the sugars can get into the zeolite. Um, I will show you that, that, that you would expect the pores are big enough to can, and we'll see that from relaxation times, and then look uh, with NMR at some details of the mobility of these molecules uh, inside the zeolite. Remember now, we're, we're changing gears here to a, a quite different situation. The question is whether the acid properties of these solids that we've been hearing about can be applied in aqueous solution to, to these molecules. So we're talking about the mobility of the sugars along with uh, or, or within the water flow for the fuel. Uh, and then, um, as you'll see from the motivation slide, uh, we would like to do isomerization of these sugars, and, and, and we hope that will be acid catalyzed by these acid sites. And so we want to have a look at that and we'll draw some conclusions. right now, uh, the objective of the, of the current focus, is to start with renewable resources, um, which would be wood or, or farm waste, and take it to a fuel additive kind of material like ethanol. Uh, this has traditionally been a, a, a biotechnology sort of area, and most of these processes have been developed along those lines, where each of the steps are, are uh, enzyme catalyzed. Um, in effect, what we want to do is look at these, this biological process and see that there are a couple of, of problems in the process. If we start down this side, which is the five carbon sugar side, hemicellulose is mostly xylose, which is the five carbon sugar, and I'll remind you of some of this chemistry on the next slide to show you the structures of these molecules. Um, but the hemicellulose is a polymer of these five carbon sugars. Um, that's a relatively easy polymer to break down by acid hydrolysis. The problem is that you get a little bit of glucose and you get mostly xylose, which is carbon sugar and xylose is not fermentable. So you can't take the xylose directly to a yeast fermentation to make ethanol. You have to do something else. Um, well, I should say that if, if, if there are any genetic engineers in the, in the group here, uh, people are working on trying to, to develop new yeast strains that will do this job, uh, but the current ones can't do it, at least not with high uh, alcohol tolerance. Um, but you can isomerize the aldose to the ketose, uh, still, still the five carbon sugar, and the xylose is fermentable, so that if we can convert the xylose to xylose, uh, then, then we'll be back on stream here. Uh, that job can be done uh, by enzymes, but the enzymes have temperature limitations, and within the temperature region that you can get to easily under those circumstances, um, the conversion is only about 15%. So if we could go to an inorganic catalyst here and raise the temperature, uh, the, the conversion of the equilibrium constant goes the right direction. And so we might be able to address this bottleneck over here with with an inorganic uh, catalyst. We come down this side, on the six carbon sugar side, uh, the glucose reaction is, it, uh, uh, we come from, from the cellulose polymer of glucose, break it down into, into to, uh, oligomers and then to the dimer, and, and the conversion from the dimer to the monomer is, is uh, enzyme catalyzed, but the enzyme is, is glucose inhibited. And if we can convert the glucose to fructose directly, take the fructose to the, to the fermentation, uh, we might be able to lower the glucose concentration in the process and, and, and have an advantage on this side too. If you look in the literature, what you will see is that these molecules, uh, the sugar molecules, are isomerized in strong acid and strong base. Uh, strong base tends to degrade the molecules more than strong acid, 
And so uh, that's how we get to the point we're at right now. Can the traditional strong acids that most of us are, are used to uh, play a role in doing these kinds of reactions uh, in the scheme that I've been talking about? The molecules here that we're going to deal with, these are the six carbon sugars. Um, most of these sugar molecules, with the exception of the, of the xylulose, um, uh, cycle in, in aqueous solution so that, that although you may see it in the, in the chemistry textbooks, the linear molecule, uh, more than 99% of, of the molecules in solution are actually in the cyclic form. Uh, the D glucose comes in two versions, the beta and the alpha form. This carbon is the C1 carbon. Uh, that's the one that we're going to label with C13 for the, for the NMR experiments. If the OH group is up in this stereochemistry, chemical uh, depiction, it's beta glucose. If the OH group is down, it's alpha. The isomerization that we're interested in is to, is to convert the, the aldose, in other words, an aldehyde group on, on, on carbon one before the cyclization occurs, to the ketose, which moves the double bonded oxygen to the second carbon. That also cycles up, and it makes this uh, six-membered ring, which is primarily in the beta form, so we get beta fructopyranose. Um, the the uh, five-membered ring uh, is also uh, favored for the fructose, and we have, again, an alpha and a beta form of the, of the furanose. So that's one isomerization. The other isomerization we're interested in is the xylose to xylose. We start out again with a beta OHF or an alpha um, pyranose ring, uh, and that can go um, either to, to uh, the, the beta or alpha furanose furanose form of the xylose, or there's a measurable amount of the linear sugar here, and now you can see a little more clearly where that, that isomerization occurs to move that double bonded oxygen down to the second part. Um, in order to decide whether this is a viable thing to do, of course, we have to decide or, or think about whether the molecules can actually get into the, to the zeolite cavities. Um, we need a size of the glucose molecule. If you look at the sizes that are generated from NMR relaxations and, and such measurements in solution, um, you get a motional average uh, uh, diameter of about 6.6 angstroms. Um, if you look at the specific shape of the sugar and you look at the, the, the molecule is smallest in the, in the flat direction, um, the, the, the values can change by an angstrom or so, uh, but basically we're looking at a molecule that's roughly 6 angstroms in size. You don't save much when you go to the 5-carbon sugar uh, because you still have that ring structure. We don't have this um, uh, extra carbon here uh, down here, but the, but the size of the molecule is still roughly the same. Uh, I'll show it slightly smaller. Now, it's, it's not sure exactly what sizes you ought to use here, uh, so I'm just going to take the, 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 the normal core openings here. Um, with HY at 7.5, roughly, angstroms, it looks like we got a good chance to get these sugars in and out. Um, with 4A, it looks like uh, we have a pretty good chance of exclusion. Uh, and with ZSM5, it's going to be a tight fit. Uh, and so that's sort of the expectation that we start out with. And then we have to look back and see whether, we can see whether that's the way things actually behave. To do the NMR measurements of the question of whether the sugars can enter or not, we're essentially going to try to force the system to accept uh, the sugar, and we'll do that by dehydrating the zeolite completely and then sorbing the water into the empty pores or the solution into the empty pores. And if we're careful about the amount of, of solution that we that we introduce, the paper is a contribution to Purdue University. The authors are Wen, Petrov, Brutzner, Rouge, Lee, Sauer, and uh, Professor Nick Dalgas who will give the paper. You see we have a small army of people doing this work. Uh, there are three principal investigators involved here. Uh, George Sow uh, in the Laboratory for Renewable Resources in the School of Chemical Engineering at Purdue, John Grissner in Chemistry, and myself. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, the NMR work was done primarily by uh, Dr. Wench and the kinetic work uh, by Jim and just give you a little forecast of where we're going. I'd like to tell you why we're interested in this question of, of the interaction of sugar molecules with zeolites, um, and then talk about two specific issues. 
Whether or not the zeolites can, the sugars can get into the zeolite, um, I will show you that, that, that you would expect the pores are big enough they can, and we'll see that from relaxation times, and then look uh, with NMR at some details of the mobility of these molecules uh, inside the zeolite. Remember now, we're, we're changing gears here to a, a quite different situation. The question is whether the acid properties of these solids that we've been hearing about can be applied in aqueous solution to, to these molecules. So we're talking about the mobility of the sugars along with uh, or, or within the water flow for the pure. Uh, and then, um, as you'll see from the motivation slide, uh, we would like to do isomerization of these sugars, and, and, and we hope that will be acid catalyzed by these acid sites. And so we want to have a look at that and we'll draw some conclusions. right now, uh, the, the objective of the, of the current focus, is to start with renewable resources, um, which would be wood or, or farm waste, and take it to a fuel additive kind of material like ethanol. Uh, this has traditionally been a, a, a biotechnology sort of area, and most of these processes have been developed along those lines, where each of the steps are, are uh, enzyme catalyzed. Um, and in fact, what we want to do is look at these, this biological process and see that there are a couple of, of problems in the process. If we start down this side, which is the five carbon sugar side, hemicellulose is mostly xylose, which is the five carbon sugar, and I'll remind you of some of this chemistry on the next slide to show you the structures of these molecules. Um, but the hemicellulose is a polymer of these five carbon sugars. Um, that's a relatively easy polymer to break down by acid hydrolysis. The problem is that you get a little bit of glucose and you get mostly xylose, which is five carbon sugar, and xylose is not fermentable. So you can't take the xylose directly to a yeast fermentation to make ethanol. You have to do something else. Um, well, I should say that if, if, if there are any genetic engineers in the, in the group here, uh, people are working on trying to, to develop new yeast strains that will do this job, uh, but the current ones can't do it, at least not with high uh, alcohol power. Um, but you can isomerize the aldose to the ketose, uh, still, still the five carbon sugar, and the xylose is fermentable, so that if we can convert the xylose to xylose, uh, then, then we'll be back on stream here. Uh, that job can be done uh, by enzymes, but the enzymes have temperature limitations, and within the temperature region that you can get to easily under those circumstances, um, the conversion is only about 15%. So if we could go to an inorganic catalyst here and raise the temperature, uh, the, the conversion of the equilibrium constant goes in the right direction. And so we might be able to address this bottleneck over here with with an inorganic uh, catalyst. We come down this side, on the six carbon sugar side, uh, the glucose reaction is, uh, we come from, from the cellulose polymer of glucose, break it down into, into to, uh, oligomers and then to the dimer, and, and the conversion from the dimer to the monomer is, is uh, enzyme catalyzed, but the enzyme is, is glucose inhibited. And if we could convert the glucose to fructose directly, take the fructose to the, to the fermentation, uh, we might be able to lower the glucose concentration in the process and, and, and have an advantage on this side too. If you look in the literature, what you will see is that these molecules, uh, sugar molecules, are isomerized in strong acid and strong base. Uh, strong base tends to degrade the molecules more than strong acid, and so uh, that's how we get to the point we're at right now. Can the traditional strong acids that most of us are, are used to uh, play a role in doing these kinds of reactions uh, in the scheme that I've been talking about? The molecules here that we're going to deal with, these are the six carbon sugars. Um, most of these sugar molecules, with the exception of the, of the xylulose, um, uh, cycle in, in aqueous solution so that, that although you may see it in the chemistry textbooks, the linear molecule, uh, more than 99% of the, of the molecules in solution are actually in the cyclic form. Uh, the D-glucose comes in two versions, the beta and the alpha form. This carbon is the C1 carbon. Uh, that's the one that we're going to label with C13 for the, for the NMR experiments. If the OH group is up in this stereochemical uh, depiction, it's beta-glucose. If the OH group is down, it's alpha -glucose. The isomerization that we're interested in is to, is to convert the, the aldose, in other words, an aldehyde group on, on, on carbon-1 before the cyclization occurs, to the ketose, which moves the double bonded oxygen to the second carbon. That also cycles up, and it makes this uh, 
uh, a six-membered ring, which is primarily in the beta form. So we get we get this uh, beta fructopyranose. Um, the the uh, five-membered ring uh, is also uh, favored for the fructose, and we have again an alpha and a beta form of the, of the furanose. So that's one isomer. The other isomerization what we're interested in is the xylose to xylose. We start out again with a beta OHF or an alpha um, pyranose ring, uh, and that can go um, either to, to uh, the, the beta or alpha furan uh, furanose form of the xylose, or there's a measurable amount of the linear sugar here, and now you can see a little more clearly where that, that isomerization occurs to move that double bonded oxygen down to the second part. Um, in order to decide whether this is a viable thing to do, of course, we have to decide or, or think about whether the molecules can actually get into the, to the zeolite cavities. Um, we need a size of the glucose molecule. If you look at the sizes that are generated from NMR relaxations and, and, and such measurements in solution, um, you get a motional average uh, uh, diameter of about 6.6 .6 angstroms. Um, if you look at the specific shape of the sugar and you look at the, the, the molecule is smallest on the flat direction, um, the, the, the values can change by an angstrom or so, uh, but basically we're looking at a molecule that's roughly six angstroms in size. You don't save much when you go to the five carbon sugar uh, because you still have that ring structure. We don't have this um, uh, extra carbon here uh, down here, but the, but the size of the molecule is still roughly the same. Uh, I'll show it slightly smaller. Now, it's, it's not sure exactly what sizes you ought to use here, uh, so I'm just going to take the, 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 the normal four openings here. Um, with HY at seven and a half, roughly, angstroms, it looks like we got a good chance to get these sugars in and out. Um, with 4A, it looks like uh, we have a pretty good chance of exclusion. Uh, and with ZSM5, it's going to be a tight fit. Uh, and so that's sort of the expectation that we start out with, and then we have to look now and see whether, we can see whether that's the way things actually behave. To do the NMR measurements of the question of whether the sugars can enter or not, we're essentially going to try to force the system to accept uh, the sugar. And we'll do that by dehydrating the zeolite completely and then sorbing the water into the empty pores or the solution into the empty pores. And if we're careful about the amount of, of solution that we, that we introduce, Namely, if we, if we try to keep the water content below the, the, the amount of water that, 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 that it would take to saturate the pores of the zeolite, um, which, which we calculate to be roughly uh, 0.4 milliliters of, of this glucose solution per gram of, ze of the Y zeolite, um, then we have two different uh, uh, choices that we can think of. If the, the uh, solution goes into the pores directly without any problem, and the, and the sugar molecules can move freely in the pores, then we expect a uniform distribution of the, of the, uh, the solution inside the zeolite. If the molecules of sugar are too big to get through the pores, but the water will be able to go in, then we would expect the water to be distributed inside. And if the sugar is left outside, if you look at the, at the stoichiometry here, you calculate, uh, assuming a, a one micron size crystal, just to, to have a number to use, um, that you're going to get about 50 layers worth of sugar. So that, that this should be a fairly well-defined situation. Molecules go in, they should have reasonable mobility. If they don't go in, you should get a fairly well-packed, uh, very dense phase uh, um, sugar layer on the outside. And by these NMR techniques, we ought to be able to, to see the difference. Um, the incipient wetness point visually for this material is about 200% of, of, of the solution that it takes to saturate the pores. So that, that we, if we look just for the, in the normal incipient wetness sort of operation where you dry the material, start putting the solution on and watch for the, for the powder to just turn wet. Uh, you can add, uh, in our uh, operation, it looks like you can add about twice as much water as you need to, to saturate the pores. And some of the, of the reaction measurements have been done under those circumstances. First thing we can look at are the T1 values for um, uh, from the NMR measurement. For these now, we're, gonna, we're looking at C13, C1 uh, uh, carbon label, C13 uh, glucose, and we're looking at the glucose, uh, the, the, T, the T1 relaxation time uh, in the NMR measurement for the glucose in contact with the 4A sieve or with the Y sieve, 
and when and I'm looking at the percent of pore filling where 100% pore filling corresponds to the to the stoichiometric amount of water that we think it would take. This actually is the structure. And what I want you to notice, uh, well, first of all, the solution T1 for the, for this concentration of sugar at two molar um, is about half a second. If you look at the T1 for the 4 azeolite, the one where we expect to see um, a sieving effect and, and a solid amount of sugar on the outside of the, of the uh, zeolite uh, crystallites, uh, we have very high T1s, 50 seconds and more. And furthermore, adding water does not change the, the T1 dramatically, 30% change in the T1 value uh, as we go from 50% to 100%. In the case of HY, when we have 50% of the pores filled uh, with the solution, uh, we get a reasonably high T1 at 20 uh, seconds as opposed to the value of 5 for the free solution. Uh, but as you add more water, uh, the T1 drops to a value close to, to the free solution value. Uh, I will reiterate this a couple of times. Uh, even, that, oh, even though that T1 value is close to the free solution value, the behavior of the sugar uh, in this state is not really liquid-like. It's quite hindered. See that in a variety of ways. Uh, but the point is that in the case of the YZ alike, where we're expecting the sugars are going to be able to get in, uh, we see a dramatic change in the relaxation behavior. In the case where they, we expect the, the sugars to be excluded, uh, we see a high value for T1 and um, uh, not very much change with the degree of hydration. But we can pursue this issue of, of the nature of the, of the sugar in these two kinds of materials in a variety of ways by looking at the details of the NMR spectrum. The clearest case to see probably is this 50% loading sample. Um, and this is the one now where the T1 has already dropped uh, a significant amount. Oh, I'm sorry. The 50% the, the loading one is, is the case where we have a T1 at 20 seconds. And if you look at the shape of this line, remember that we're expecting a doublet for the beta and the alpha form. And, and the line looks just like a broadened doublet without extra species. If you look at the 100% loading of the 4A catalyst, which still had a, a T1 of, of 50 seconds, uh, 55 seconds, um, it's basically a broadened line. If you look very carefully, you might see a little bit of, a, of a evidence of a shoulder over here. Uh, but basically, there's, there's no narrowed line, motionally narrowed line, uh, in this structure. The behavior or the, the characteristics of the 100% loaded sample are really quite different. Um, we see a broad line underneath here, which accounts for this width, but it's clear that these peaks over here are, are sharper than can it be accommodated by this curve shape. This has to be the sum of at least two different states, one that's relatively narrow and one that's relatively broad. We can look at the details of those uh, uh, different states by, by following the relative values of the, of the, of the sharp liquid-like or, or emotionally average state and the broad, uh, uh, more immobile state as a function of the contact time in the cross-polarization experiment. I, I've done a division of these curves somewhat arbitrarily, just taking the, the height of the valley as indicative of the amount of the, of the broad state. Uh, that's not quantitative, but, but for the sake of our argument, it would be good enough. And, and what we see is that, as typically expect this, this relative intensity or the intensity as a function of contact time to go through a maximum. Um, the rising side has to do with, the, with the, 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 the dipole coupling and how well you can transfer magnetization from the protons to the carbon. And, and the decay on the other side has to do with the T1 row relaxation time of the protons themselves. And, and the more mobile the state, the more we expect this, I'm sorry, the more immobile the state, the more efficient the dipolar coupling and the more we expect this maximum to move to the left. So that on the, from the blue line, we see a, a maximum at about 0.5 milliseconds. So, so that corresponds to the immobile state. It's a little hard to see on this slide, but if you look at the lengths of these lines that I've marked in red, um, maybe you can see in this plot that this line is longer than the two next to it. So we're expecting the maximum in that more mobile state uh, to be around 2 milliseconds in, uh, for the contact time. Uh, we can show that a little more clearly. By, by looking, by taking the free induction decay from the measurement and suppressing the fast relaxing part um, and just looking at the, at, at, at the longer relaxation time part. And, and that's what you see here. The broad peak has been removed and the maximum comes at about two milliseconds as we were expecting. So what we see is we have two different states uh, in, in the 
in the 100 percent pores filled with the, with the in YZ like the sugar solution. Um, uh, one state perhaps that's interacting with the walls, and one state that is that is uh, uh, a little bit more uh, fully hydrated and, and, and has freer rotation. Uh, remember, if this were a real solution, we wouldn't see the cross polarization at all. Uh, and, and so that this is not a fully mobile liquid-like state that you would see in free solution, but a restricted movement. Mobility in the solid. Two different states with different mobility, one high and one low. Um, if we just go back to the 4A state for a minute, uh, we're expecting now that that's going to look highly immobile. Um, and what we see, in fact, is that we get uh, in this cross polarization time uh, experiment. Um, remember, we're looking at that doublet compressed here, and, and we're looking at the change in the maximum intensity as a function of cross polarization time. We see a relatively fast polarization, and so again, by half a millisecond or so, we're, we're, we're getting up to the, to the maximum. But here, the T1 row is significantly longer uh, for this state. That's characteristic of a more um, immobilized state as well. So, so all the information together uh, uh, for the, the um, 4A would, would be consistent with the idea that, that, it, that the, the sugar is in a highly immobile state, and for the YZ light, we have two different states one mobile and less mobile. Uh, the final uh, piece of evidence to, 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 I think, to make that uh, very strong argument has to do with, with, with turning off now the proton decoupling and, and looking at the, the uh, CPMAS spectrum of the carbon-13 in the, the, the uh, dipolar field of, of the proton. At the 50% loading, where we had essentially all of the sugar that we could see in the immobilized state, we see a very broad line that has the, the full range of about 25 kilohertz. That's the maximum uh, proton C13 dipolar coupling that you can expect. This is a characteristic of a highly immobile state. As we go to higher and higher loadings, what we're seeing is the appearance is still got a broad background, but, but growing in on top of that is a, is a significantly more mobile state. Uh, and, and this, again, is, is consistent with everything that we've said so far on the basis of the NMR data. And um, if we look at the 4A system, we see what we were expecting. Anyway, it doesn't matter how much water there is. We still see that 25 kilohertz maximum broadening. Uh, and this is an immobilized state consistent with the idea that the sugar molecules are excluded from the small pores of the azeolite, but they do get into the larger pores of the Y-zeolite. Um, the case for the ZSM-5 is, is a little bit more murky at the moment. Um, I, I guess we're leaning toward the idea that it gets in, uh, but I think we're not ready to say that, and so I, I, I will, won't be talking about the DNA part of that uh, at this point. Now, once we've got the idea that where the sugar is in the zeolite, um, in the variable temperature probe, since these reactions will start at around 80 or 70 or 80 degrees centigrade, um, we may want to take them eventually up to 130 or 150 degrees, and we can't do that in the probe right now, but we can take them up to 80 degrees, and we can follow the reaction in the NMR. So what we're looking at now is the, is the remember the beta and the alpha form, this is even close to 80 degrees, and we're going to follow this reaction several hours time, and uh, the peak's not very big, but it's big enough to be able to measure, and we're seeing um, uh, the beta fructoparanose, and that's, that's the left line, and the other line on this low shoulder right there is the two uh, uh, furanose forms. And so what we're looking at is the loss of, of glucose and the appearance of, of uh, fructose, and we can do the kinetics uh, and get some measurements uh, directly from the NMR spectrum. Uh, so there is isomerization going on. Like. Um, the xylose also isomerizes. This one is at a lower temperature where the rate is, is slower, and, it's, and, and uh, uh, maybe you wouldn't believe me based on this that these are the xylose groups, those little bumps over there. Um, they're a little ugly, but I'll blow them up.